Let's pray together as we worship and fellowship. Father, we thank you for the victory that you've given these your children and others who are coming to the meetings and who else also have been get, gotten the victory over smoking. And we pray, Father, that uh, you'll bless them, that they may continue to grow in your grace and love and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And as we spend time here and I share what you have done, may your name be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. First, I'd like to share with you this particular verse of Scripture as a reminder of why we share our testimony. But let him that glory of glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So this morning, what I'm going to share is what he has done and the marvels that the Lord is able to perform in the lives of people. Beginning with uh, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, just part of the verse is what I want to focus on. It says, ye are complete in him. Notice it says, ye are complete in him. I was uh, born in a little island called Puerto Rico. And uh, the place where I was born is called Santurce, uh, which is, by the way, uh, St. James in, in uh, transliteration into English. It's about right here by the capital, just uh, across the, the uh, lagoon from the capital, San Juan. And in those days when I was born, uh, this is where we lived. If you can see, all the houses are on stilk. Uh, they're, they're catwalks. And the only time the toilet flushed was when the tide came in and went out. Uh, we had to, um, those of us who were not wealthy enough had to walk through it, while people who had a little bit more cash could walk on the catwalk. And so this is what it would look like if you didn't have um, the cat walk to walk all the way up to your house. And of course, this is the tide in, and you can see all the uh, rubbish and garbage. There was no running water, there was no sewer. Uh, it was just, uh, in fact, several years ago, I was in a church up in Laurelwood, and the head elder, uh, we began to talk. And he said, uh, so where are you originally from? I said, Puerto Rico. He said, what part of Puerto Rico? I said, uh, Santurce. He said, what part of Santurce? I said, El Fanguito. He said, no. You didn't come from there, did you? I said, yeah, that's where I was born. He said, I was heart sick. I was a sailor in those days in Puerto Rico. And I had never, ever in my life seen such poverty as I saw there. We felt so bad for those kids who were barefooted and many times they didn't have clothing to wear. And so we were Adventists, two of us, and we determined we were going to at least sweeten up the, uh, what we could for those kids. So we would go to the PX and, go, and come back with candy and hand out candy to those kids. And I said, Thanks for the candy. <laughs> and he began to cry. He said, I can't believe that you came from there. And here you are today, a minister. I said, praise be to God. Because it is God that does it. From uh, El Fanguito, my mother and stepfather moved us to New York City. What a contrast, what do you say? Hmm? 
And it was here where I first encountered things that I never experienced before as a child, uh, something called racism. And it was here that I, I uh, was met by a, a man who came up to me and acted like he had something horrible to spit out. Then he spat in the gutter and said, why don't you go back where you came from? And that began in the a terrible crisis of worthlessness. And I decided then that I was going to do something to make myself feel complete. But how do you reach completeness? How do you uh, achieve it? How do you reach it? How do you gain completeness? And as a child, I did not know, but I began on the quest to find completeness in my life. So, early on, I got interested in different things. I remember one time thinking that if I could become a trampolinist, I could be complete. And of course, the trampolinist, you know, you have to learn to do all the stunts, the somersaults, etc. And I was uh, getting pretty, pretty high up in terms of uh, not just jumping up in the air, but um, in terms of being a good trampolinist. And I thought that if I could just reach a certain level, I would be what? Complete. So one of the hardest uh, uh, tricks to do is called a double somersault off the trampolines, and you're jumping up and down. And you have to actually go high enough so that you can do two before you hit the mat again. And uh, very few people uh, were able to do that. And I thought, okay, I'm going to shoot for it. And I did. I did a double somersault. And I thought after I accomplished it, I'd be complete. But after I accomplished it, there was nothing. You just had a moment of excitement, people patting on your head, you know, and congratulating you and all that. That was it. And I discovered that being a trampoline doesn't make you feel complete. So I tried other things, which I won't mention, but uh, the next thing that I thought would make me complete was when I was about uh, 12 years old, um, actually 11 years old, I thought oh, since girls came into focus that if I could just have a girlfriend, I would be complete. And there was this very pretty girl in the school that I discovered I was not the only one interested in. And I determined I was going to beat the other guys. And I succeeded. She became my girlfriend. And I can remember walking across the school ground with her arm in my arm and seeing those boys green with envy. And I used to think to myself, eat your heart out, boys. But summer came. And when summer came, school would be over. And to my chagrin and to my sadness, the girl found another person that could make her more complete than I could. And so she left me. And I remember the terrible song that began to become popular for the summer break. It was called Sealed with a Kiss. I don't know how many of you dinosaurs remember that or not. Yes, it's going to be a what? A cool, lonely summer. You remember those words? And every time I remember those words, I start crying because I was broken hearted. The girl left me. Well, it was then that I discovered that girls don't make you complete. Sorry, girls. So I uh, then shifted my focus and I became interested in music. Uh, didn't have any money to get a music lessons, etc. I just used my ingenuity and to teach myself how to learn to play. Uh, in my day, kids, did you hear what I said? In my day, you don't have it today. Too bad for you. Now, what am I talking about? Children, we used to have what is called a phonograph. A what? Now, what does that mean, kids? What's a phonograph? You see, I told you you don't have them this day. And so, you have those silly old things called CD players and DVDs and 
All right. You know what a phonograph is. Amen. They're record player. That's right. Good girl. So I uh, would take that record player, but you remember it was the old square ones that had several uh, speeds on it? Do you remember that? So it has 16, 33 and a third, 45 and 78. So I thought if I could, if somehow I could slow down this music so I could tell where it was going, I could learn how to play it. So I slowed it down, way down to 16, and you remember how it sounded when you slowed down the record? Do you remember that? So I slowed it down and tried to listen to it and find where it was. I loosened my guitar strings down as low as I could, and uh, then I found the progression. Then I put it up to 45 and discovered it was not in the same place, so I had to figure out where it was. And uh, once I figured out what it was, I was able to stay up with it. Then 78, and I was flying. And that's how I learned to play bass guitar. Taught myself to play bass guitar. Well, at the AM, before I learned to play bass guitar, however, we got in, uh, to create a group called Donnie and the Twilights. Donnie and the Twilights uh, became a very popular group in New York City, and I was 12 at that time. So I began quite early in show business. At 12 years old, we uh, had our own uh, manager. We had a, uh, our own tailor-made suits. It was shark skin tailor-made suits. How many of you remember shark skin suits? Any of you? Some of you remember that. Uh, so I had, we had shark skin suits. We had our own car, brand new car that, that was bought for us with our name, Donnie and the Twilights on the, on the, on the car. And uh, we were now going places. We were performing in different places in New York City. So things were going well as far as um, advancing in the career. But along with that, unfortunately, our lead singer, Donnie, who had a voice that was golden. Whenever we sang, and he, we would do what is called doo-wop music today, uh, so we would sing the harmony, one would do the sound of a bass, and Donnie would chirp like a canary. Uh, he really could sing extremely well. So much so that, that Count Basie, and I'm gonna use names that you may recognize, may not recognize, Count Basie wanted him to be part of their singing group, but fortunately he chose not to because we were very close friends, almost like brothers. By the time he was 15, they found an overdose. So along with show business came another element that we had not uh, bargained for. 15 years old, gone. Uh, we were devastated. Where do you find another golden voice like Donnie's? Well, there wasn't. We never did find another golden voice like Donnie. Devastated as we were, we decided to move ahead. My mother and five of us and I'm the one with the name Louie over it, so now you know which one I, I was. We formed a group called the Vampires. And we actually did dress like vampires. The reason why we are standing the way we are is so that the back picture would look like a bat. Can you see the shadow? Looking like a bat. Well, we discovered something interesting. You want to get attention? Do something stupid, and you'll get attention. And so we got a lot of attention, looking like vampires. Uh, unfortunately, the, the toll of drugs, uh, or the drugs took their toll upon some of the boys, and we ended up um, being four. However, one of the, the goals of being in, in the profession, music business, is to record. And we thought if you could just record, you would hit where you wanted to be. Then you could feel complete. Now you're a recording artist. So here's our business card, a copy of it. Uh, our headquarters was in Brooklyn, of course. And our manager happened to be one of the, uh, the, he was a borough president of Brooklyn. Now in New York City, you have five boroughs, and each borough has a president. And so he was uh, like the mayor of the town. But he was a borough president of Brooklyn with a population of four million in those days. And so we were what you would call connected. So much so that we were able to uh, perform in different places like Waldorf Astoria. Any of you have heard of the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, which is one of the large uh, famous hotels in New York. Uh, we were able to play for all the city officials uh, and uh, 
after we performed for them, then they took us up to the penthouse. And for us ghetto kids, a penthouse didn't mean anything until we finally got up there and discovered what it was. And performing for all of these big wigs was something very intriguing for us. When we got to the penthouse, we had four go-go girls. We had two on one side and two on the other side. So when we performed, they would wiggle and waggle. And uh, when we got up there, we noticed the girls kind of uh, ooing and aahing about this handsome Latino. And they kept on saying, Placido, Placido. Well, later on, I discovered the Placido Domingo. You probably heard of him today. Uh, because of our connections, we, we became, by the way, uh, number one group in all of New York City of the week. Our picture was posted in, on the Broadway, uh, right in the Broadway building in Broadway, New York. Uh, this is my cabaret license, which you had to have a license in order to perform. And our recording studio was right above the Ed Sullivan Show. I don't know how many of you remember the Ed Sullivan Show. Uh, so now they call it the Late Show, uh, CBS. But the, the gray building is actually the building where we were uh, doing recordings. So now we became recording artists. And we thought that by recording, becoming recording artists, we would be what? Complete, but we weren't. No matter what uh, I, I did, I could never get to that level. No matter how much I achieved, how high I went, uh, I thought of the, the, that if I could have more money, I'd be complete. If I could have more girls, I could be complete. Uh, so no matter what I had, the more, the more, the more that you got, the more excitement, excitement the more performances. Uh, we, we could perform for thousands at one time or a few at one time, but it didn't matter how big, how small the crowd. The, the initial uh, going into the performance was always exhilarating. There was always excitement about it. But after a while, it just became uh, nothing but another, another, what we would call gig to do. So we went from uh, performance to performance to performance, and after a while, it just lost its dazzle. Uh, and the problem was that I was also getting deeper, deeper, deeper uh, with the abuse problem. Uh, we then got rid of our managers, because by this time, we were paying 50% of our income. We are paying 20% to the main manager, 20% 20, 20 to the booking agent, and 10% to the assistant manager. And so when I became an Adventist and discovered that all I got wanted was 10%, I thought it was a great deal. <laughs> Do you hear what I said? 50% of our income we were paying. And so we decided that we, all we needed was the booking agent. We didn't need anybody to manage us. We know how to manage ourselves. So we got rid of the manager, forgetting that the equipment belonged to them. So when we got rid of the manager, we got rid of our equipment as well. So we didn't have anything to perform with. Now we're in trouble. What do you do? Well, we told the place where we were performing that we couldn't perform anymore. He said, why not? We don't have any equipment. Oh, he said, but you must perform. He was breaking down walls. His club was growing and growing and growing because of our popularity. And so he said, you can't stop. You got to keep going. I said, well, we don't have any equipment. He said, I'll take care of that. Come tomorrow. Next day we showed up and he took us in his car and took us to a, another place. Uh, this place happened to be uh, a, another club, but the, the club was kind of uh, uh, associated with uh, the Bayonne boys. And you don't know who those are, but I can tell you later. Anyway, as we went into the nightclub, uh, it was daytime, by the way. We went downstairs. We looked at the at the walls, and there was a picture of, Sam, uh, of uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, Joe Lewin, and, and other famous people. It turned out that this was the mob or the mafia. And so he introduced us to a fella who came with a big cigar out of his side of his mouth, and he said, "Hey, boys, I understand you got a problem." And we said, yes. He said, well, I'll fix that for you, boys. Just call me Godfather Nicky. So we got in his car. He took us to New York City. Uh, he said, get anything you want. We said, anything? He said, anything. Get it, all that you need. So we, we were like kids in the Christmas store. We went hog wild. And we got everything that we can get. Echo, PA systems, uh, drums, sets, uh, you name it, everything. And he then took out of his pocket a wad of money and uh, paid it cash. We had never seen that much money in our lives come out of somebody's pocket. 
So we thought we struck it rich, right? So we, now we thought we would be what? We're in. We're, the mafia now is our, our manager. And all we had to do, he said, was sign a little contract and, uh, with the association. So we signed the contract. However, I was, I was really quite, quite uh, disturbed by this because my brothers who were in gangs, the older brothers, used to, I would hear them talking. And one of the things they would always say, you never want to get into the mafia because once you get in, you can't get out. Well, now I was in. How do you get out? And the problem was that they began to share with us their secrets. And that's one way to keep you in. Once you know their secrets, then you're stuck. I didn't want to hear the secrets. And so they would uh, tell the secrets to the other boys, and the other boys would try to share the secrets with me. And uh, I used to say, look, I, I don't want to hear it. Well, they were enthralled. They were excited that now they had all this protection. In fact, when one of the boys got caught by the police and was going to be sentenced, there was a little note passed to the judge. He's our boy, leave him alone. And he was dismissed, even though he was uh, guilty of the charges. And so we had all this, this uh, uh, umbrella protection, but it didn't help us any. It just kept on making us go down, 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 morally, etc. So. What happened was that one uh, time we got a performance out of, out of New, New Jersey, and we were up in upstate New York. And when while there, they wanted to go back to the club. It was cr close to Christmas. They wanted to get back there. I didn't want to go back there. And we got into an argument. And I said, if you go back, I'll quit. But this time, I was determined I was not going back. And I'll tell you, one of the things that was interesting is this, that while the excitement was going on, I didn't think of anything but the excitement. When quiet moments came, there was something nagging at me that no matter what I tried, there was always something missing. And I did not know what it was. I was sure that it was more performance or more money or more excitement. But I knew in those quiet moments that none of that was phasing it. There was still something empty inside that nothing was satisfying. And I was certain it was not religion because I had been turned off to religious people. When I was a young man, I saw all sorts of things that were happening uh, that is now coming out in, light, uh, in, in the light. You understand what I'm saying, adults, uh, priests, uh, etc. And so, I knew all of that. I knew what was going on. I had no desire. I got to the place where I became cynical against religion and uh, thinking that religion was something only for the old and the ugly. If you're old and ugly, you might as well go to church because you're not going to make it out in the world anyway. That, that was my thinking. So I did not feel like, like uh, it was religion. But what is it? What is it? What is it? And I just kept on going in this vicious cycle. So when the boys decided they were going to go back to the club, I told them I wasn't going. I thought if I threatened that I would quit, they would not go. But they surprised me and said, we're going. Good riddance. And so they took my equipment with them. And I went and gave them two weeks. And I said, I'm going to give you two weeks. And uh, in two weeks, I quit. So find yourself my replacement. So I did quit. But when I quit, I didn't know what to do. And one particular night, then, I was in another nightclub down in the place called Greenwich Village, down in the lower east side of Manhattan. And while I was there, listening to one of my friends doing a performance at a break, somebody came up to him, talking to him, and uh, my friend was pointing toward me. So this man came to me and said, I understand you're a bass player. Yeah, I am. What about it? He said, well, I'm looking for a bass player. I said, for what? He said, uh, to play with Bill Hale in the Comets. I said, get lost. Because I knew that in New York City there are a lot of phonies. There are a lot of people who are always saying that they were this and they were that uh, when it was not the reality. In fact, today, you can go to the website of Bill Hale in the Comets and you'll see the whole list of people who said that they performed with the Comets and it says right there, untrue. They never performed with the Comets. So there they'll show you who did and who didn't. And fortunately, you'll find my mugshot there, okay, to demonstrate that I did. So 
when he said, when he joined the comments, I said, come on. He said, it's true. I'm looking for a bass player. But I understand you're a pretty good one. I said, I am. In those days, I could play it behind my neck. I could uh, play with my teeth. I could do anything with it. So um, I demonstrated my abilities the next day. And then I became part of the Comets. Here's some pictures of, uh, of the vampires when we finally became four. Uh, Mo was the one who got caught for drugs. And by the way, unfortunately, he died a drug addict. And uh, so did uh, Tony. Tony became uh, basically fried. I don't know. What, I've never been able to find Manny. I believe Manny's probably dead as well. Here I am in a split. You know what a split is, right? You go down, open, oh, split your, your legs. Okay, I'm down with my legs split, and I'm walking with my bass player and doing a solo on, my, on a split. So there was nothing I could not do with the instrument. However, it didn't do anything for my soul. It just inflated my ego, and that's it. I was used to the nightlife. This is where I used to hang out. Um, an actual picture, by the way, of the times, back in the 60s. And uh, finally, when I uh, was told I was going to be the, the bass player for Bill Haley Thomas, I was elated. Because at this time, I was 21 years old. And how many kids at 21 could boast that they were playing with the most famous band in, in those days of the world? In fact, today, Bill Haley is claimed to be the father of rock and roll. Uh, those of you who remember the song, Rock Around the Clock, or See You Later, Alligator, uh, etc. Um, in those days, they were it. But I thought by joining them that things would be cleaner. But I discovered that things were not cleaner. I assume that because they were so high in, in notoriety that, that it was a different lifestyle. It wasn't. One of the boys had a $200 a day drug habit back then. $200 a day. And we used to have to tighten up his tuxedo in the back with straight pins so it looked like it fit him in the front because he kept on losing weight. He was very skinny. I was, I was uh, disappointed, to be honest with you, because I thought somehow I'd get out of the muck and mire of, of the mafia and all that lifestyle. But here I was, hoping that things would be better. They did tell me that now Rudy Pompelli, the one who played the saxophone player, told me that uh, I was too good for them, and that when we got to Hollywood, they would introduce me to other acts so that I can continue to climb up the ladder. Then they also told me that uh, we were going to do a, a, a competition in Europe, that we would be able to compete against the Beatles. By that time, the Beatles were, uh, had already become very famous worldwide. And so I was looking forward for a competition with Paul McCartney on the bass, as well as Bang Bang, who was our drummer, looking forward to uh, playing circles around uh, Ringo Starr. So we were uh, expiring to uh, kind of get higher than the Beatles. But then uh, after several performances, uh, we took a break before this world tour. When I got uh, the time off, I decided to go up to New York City. I was down in Florida at the time. Decided to go to New York City and visit my mother. When I got home, uh, I was taken back because uh, I went to relax and discovered that my brother, the third oldest brother, Willie, was on his knees and he was praying. And that shook me up because we boys never prayed. My mother prayed. That was a thing for women. So we never prayed. And when I saw my brother on his knees praying and mentioning me by name in particular, it got me upset. I thought he was trying to put a spell on me or something. 
because my mother was involved in spiritism. And I knew that, that that's the way they would put spells on people. So I went to my mother and I said, what in the world is going on with him? Uh, he's religious, leave him alone. So Willie finished praying and they came to talk to me about Jesus. And friends, at, at that time, I was just a raw heathen. And when he tried to talk to me about Jesus, I just reacted to it. I told him, I don't want to hear it. Don't talk to me about this thing. Uh, keep it to yourself. Well, you don't understand. I said, I understand one thing. If you don't quit, we're going to have to have a fight. Well, about a year before this experience, or two years before this experience, the vampires, we had a, a gang, a motorcycle gang that would follow us around us, uh, like the Hells Angels. And they decided to have a drug party. The drug party, everybody got intoxicated with whatever was offered. And I don't remember what I took. Of course, I always participated. But somebody asked a question after everybody had taken their stuff. Who is God? And the whole night we spent trying to decipher who God was. Here we were, intoxicated, drugged up, and we're trying to discover God. We spent the entire night speaking about God. And uh, it was the first time that I heard the plan of salvation as Seventh-day Adventists understand it. I can say this, I don't know if it was an angel or a fallen Adventist who got mixed up with that lifestyle. I can't tell you which. All I can tell you is that's the first time I heard the whole plan of salvation as later on I got to know it. When I left that uh, party and I was driving home, I was struck with this awful, terrible, terrifying thought. If there really is a God, I'm in serious trouble. So I put the thought aside because it terrified me to think that I would be in real terrible trouble if in reality God did exist. So now, two years forward, and my brother's praying for me and talking to me about God. And I had no interest in hearing him. However, about two days later, my older brother shows up, who is a terrorist, involved in terrorism. And uh, he came to tell me that he's going to get baptized. Now, I didn't understand this thing about baptized, Robert. The only thing I knew about people being baptized were little babies where you, you sprinkle water on their heads, you understand, as a Catholic. So my brother's going to get baptized. And he wanted me to be there in his baptismal service. So I consented simply out of respect because in my home, the, brother, the older brother was the one that you have to respect. And since my dad had abandoned the family, um, he was like uh, the dad of the house. We, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the kind of brothers that, that uh, God gave me. But my brother Gene was going to get baptized. He wanted me to be there. So when the baptismal day came, I showed up. I have to confess to you that I, I, when I entered the church doors, I felt completely out of place. It was an, a weird, awkward situation for me. I was used to the, the dark lights, you know, the, the dark rooms with the dim lights. I was used to the uh, room filled with smoke and and people chattering and, and music playing and all that. And I entered into this place and I thought I had entered into some holy place and I felt out of place. And you know, later on I thought, thank you God that you didn't take me from where I was right into heaven. I would have died. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so I thought this was a holy place and I said, entered in. I felt awkward. And uh, of course, I went in with my showbiz uh, clothing on. My pants were hip hugger, bell bottom, rainbow color. My shirt was a Tom Jones shirt, up and down to the belly button to show how macho you are. When I was kind of bloomer sleeve. I had 10 rings, on, uh, one on each finger. So my hair was down to my shoulders. Uh, boots like the Beatles. So here I walk into the church and like a Christmas tree. And everybody's looking at me. So I decided to just shrink in down into the pew in the back and get out of sight. Well, the program started. And 
I remember my sister-in-law and my brother being brought up to the front into the baptistry. And as I was watching, they took my sister-in-law first, and the minister raised up his hand and said something and then put my sister-in-law in the water. She came up and she was crying. And I thought, silly women, they're always crying about nothing. Then my brother took his place, and they put him under. He came up, and he also was crying. Now I was troubled, because I'd never seen my brother cry. I had never seen any of my brothers cry. We were tough kids growing up in the ghettos of New York, and men don't cry, you understand? And so when I saw him cry, I was troubled. And I began to wonder, kind of a flashback to that time of two years before, could they have found God? There was something different about them. They were no longer cursing. They were no longer carousing out in the streets. They were no longer drinking alcohol. They were no longer smoking. I mean, everything that, that supposedly brought pleasure to the life, they had abandoned. And they could find joy in just reading that black book, and I couldn't figure that out. These guys are crazy. What's gone wrong with them? But I couldn't deny that there was something different about them. And it troubled me. And the thought came to me, could they have found God? And when I thought that thought, again, I remembered, if there is a God, I'm in serious trouble. You understand? So it began to trouble me, bother me. And I wanted to get out of the church as fast as I could. I felt like something was surrounding me, like I was getting to be caged in. And I didn't like that feeling. So I, I left church. And when I got out of the influence of the church, I felt somewhat better. But it still troubled me. My brother crying, you know, in front of 200 people. What's going on? What's taking place? And so I began to, to feel more and more uncomfortable about the situation. And frankly, folks, I decided that, that if there is a God and he's watching, uh, I need to, to find a way to let him know that I can't stay around. So... I wanted to get out of town as fast as I could so I could continue to go on the tour that I was going to go on. Okay, two-week vacation. The time was almost, uh, almost up. So I was just um, biding my time, hoping that the time would come and I could say, okay, God, sorry, I have to get back to what I used to do. It's amazing how you rationalize, isn't it? So unfortunately, before I left, a call came in from Bill Miller saying, Lou, they used to call me Little Lou. Lou, uh, the tour had been postponed. And I didn't tell him what I was going through. I just said, oh, no. So then I felt I was going to have to face the music. You've heard that term before, right? I was going to have to deal with it. So. Uh, here's a picture of myself with the comets. If you notice, I'm the last one on the, your right, my left. And uh, here's, here's my name here, Lou. That's what they used to call me, Little Lou. This is a newspaper article written. We were doing USO shows for the Navy down in, in Jacksonville, Florida, and in Georgia, etc. And when, when I wanted to escape and I realized I couldn't escape, I thought, okay, I, I'm going to have to prove to this God that I need this exciting life. I, I just could not figure out what I would do with my life if I, if I began to feel like I needed to make a change. And so I wanted to kind of prove to him that I needed to, to continue this lifestyle. So there was a, a dance and that dance was uh, to, to, uh, in this place called the St. George Hotel in Brooklyn, New York. It was a hotel that had the largest saltwater swimming pool in the globe. And so they had nine bands that they had contracted to play nonstop music from 9 o'clock at night to 4 o'clock in the morning. And I determined that I was going to go to that place to prove to God that I needed this exciting life. So I went to dance. I was a professional dancer. When I got there to dance... Uh, I began dancing at 9 o'clock, and I danced till midnight, nonstop. Then I got tired, and I wanted to see if I could find another girl whose talents were uh, as good as mine. So I went up to the balcony, 
And as I was up in the balcony looking down, trying to find some girl that could re really could, um, do the same as I was doing. Um, in those days, everybody had to come with a suit and tie and with dresses or a skirt. Unlike today, you can go with a blue jeans any place, right? In those days, it was different. You couldn't go into these places unless you were well-dressed. So here were all these well-dressed people. And by the way, the hairdo was called the beehive. How many of you remember the beehive? How many of you had the beehive at some time? All right, there were some beehives here. All right, so girls, it was just uh, combing your hair, teasing it up to look like a beehive, okay? So here are all these beehives down below, jumping up and down. The dancers in those days was the chicken, the dog, the waddle, and the monkey. You remember those dancers at all? Okay, chicken, the waddle. The waddle was walking like a duck, you know and the, the dog and the monkey. So I was always one of the first monkeys on the, on the dance floor, and I was looking down to see uh, which girl was really wiggling and waggling, and as I was looking down, all of a sudden, I no longer saw what I used to see and interpret before. Wow, look at that girl, wow, look at that. No, this time it was different. My eyes were open. And I saw people acting like animals. And I was taken back. And I was struck with the thought, this is living? Acting like an animal is living? And I was so disgusted with the scene that I looked up to the ceiling and I said, God, if you're there, do for me what you've done for my brothers. And that was my decision that night to turn my life over to God. Now, I did not know what it would mean because the only thought that came to me if I followed God was that I would have to abandon the life of show business. And the only skills that I had was working in a machine shop. So I would have to go back and be an immigrant again, and uh, laugh, live there the rest of my life as a, in an immigrant in a dingy, dark factory. I had no skills. And so, stepping down from stardom down to nothing was humiliating thought. But at that moment, when I saw the contrast, and God showed me how he was seeing it. Intelligent human beings being brought down to the thought that acting like animals was happiness. I was just floored by that. I decided I was going to follow God. So I left. And when I left, the conviction became stronger. I didn't know it was conviction. I just know that I began to feel uncomfortable about my lifestyle, the things I was into, things I was doing. And before this, I didn't have any feeling about that they were bad. But as, as I began to feel conviction, I began to see the error. I began to see the, the fallacy, the, like, the plastic lifestyle. I began to see the, the immorality, the, the, the sinfulness of my life. And uh, frankly, folk, I felt like like uh, I was standing before the judgment hall of God, and all my, my sins had become revealed before me. And as I dealt with that, I went home, I remember, and I was wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. As I was wrestling, I began to, to, to talk to God, just like I'm standing here. I was in the apartment, and I'm, I'm looking up to the ceiling, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm asking God to help me, to help me, to... to then I began to ask God to forgive me, to forgive me. And as I was struggling there, trying to, to somehow find relief from all of this uh, uh, guilt that I was feeling, I, I sank down to my knees. And I sank down to my knees as I did so. All of a sudden, I felt something wet and warm on my cheeks, and I didn't know what that was. So I looked up to the ceiling to see if there was something dripping from up, up above. And there was nothing dripping from the ceiling. They were dripping from my eyes. I hadn't cried for years. I had become so hardened, so callous, that I had no feeling. And for the first time, I began to feel. It was like I had been dead, and I was coming alive again. 
And, and then I began to ask for God to take away the things that I was into, the, the, the addictions, etc. And all of a sudden I felt a peace that came over me. And that peace that came over me made me even cry the more. It turned from sorrow to joy. And as I stood up, I had the full consciousness that I was no longer an addict. Instantly, what did I say? Instantly, God took away from me the, 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 the drug addiction, the alcohol addiction, the cigarette addiction, the coffee addiction. I mean, it was just gone in an instant. Now, for me then, I needed that because I needed to have the certainty that God was real and alive. Did you hear what I'm saying? I needed the evidence. And when I had that evidence, when instantly was gone, from that day on, I've never have had a desire for the alcohol, the booze, the, the cigarettes, etc. Even the coffee. I grew up drinking coffee all my childhood. I drank coffee. My mother made coffee. In fact, my family in Puerto Rico owned a coffee plantation. Okay? So I grew up drinking coffee, coffee, coffee. My mother, though she was poor, she would grind her own beans and cook her own beans. And uh, many times the coffee we drank was stronger than the coffee outside that you bought in the store because it watered down. Sometimes we drank coffee in a little cup. It was very thick coffee, strong stuff. Anyway, instantly gone. Praise the Lord, what do you say? That God has the power to deliver. And when I realized that, I stood up and I sensed that God had heard my prayer and also the sense that he had forgiven me. I rejoiced. And now my tears had turned from tears of sorrow to tears of joy. I was rejoicing. There is a God. He is real. He is alive. He has power. He can deliver. My friends, I was just excited. And I decided then, as I went to the mirror and looked at myself, I couldn't believe that I had become kind of a half woman, half man with my long hair, with my dress on, the stuff that I had. And I thought to myself, where in the world have I gotten? And I decided I took off all that clothing and I gathered all my tuxedos and all the stuff that I had from show business and I gave them to my mother to give to the poor. I don't know what poor slob is out there work, walking with my suits on, but anyway, I got rid of all that stuff. Then my rings, I took them off. And I threw them in the garbage can, all 10 rings. I didn't care the value. What I cared was, I'm free, you understand? So I got rid of all that stuff. Then I went to the barber, got a haircut. And he, he delighted in cutting my long hair, you know. He was one of those guys that felt that a man shouldn't have long hair. So he, and I was clean. Then I became honest. I became what? Honest. I was drafting the, the, I was dodging the draft all the time because I was going from club to club to club to club. And I wrote a letter saying, uh, I, uh, I'm here. And I got back very quickly uh, another letter in response with a subway token scotch tape to the top left-hand corner. Now, what, why, why would they send you a token, train token? So you have no excuse that you have no money to get to report, okay? So I was here and now inducted into the United States Army. Well, God delivered me. He brought me out of that mess. And uh, to, to the glory of God, that, that victory that God gave me was a momentum that served for me to believe that if God could deliver me, God could deliver others. And friends, for the first time, I felt complete. I then understood that people are doing all sorts of things to somehow find completeness. They think if I could just have a business, if I could just build a house, if I could just have a fast car, if I could have a fast motorcycle, if I could become popular, if I could become handsome, beautiful, etc., uh, if I can get a doctor's degree. In other words, somehow we have, we have uh, goals and, and, and we want to do things with our life that we feel will finally help us to arrive, you understand? To achieve, to get there. But all of us who have arrived or achieved recognize that, that uh, you really don't arrive at anything. You can have all the money you want to. I have friends who are multimillionaires. 
having all the money they want to that's not really satisfying. Do you hear what I'm saying? You can, you can strive to get your ND, you know, a, a MD title. And you think, okay, now I got the MD title. And once you get there, then you say, okay, now I got to pay my, all the bills that I in, incurred while I was studying. The loans and all that that you took, right? Then you have to struggle through all of that. Well, let me say this. God allows us to accomplish things in our lives. But the things that we accomplish is not what he wants to satisfy the longings of the heart. What satisfies the longings of the heart is he alone. God has reserved in us, all of us, a space that nothing else can fill. Nothing else. Only the master can fill it. And when I discovered that, I wanted to go and tell the world. And by the way, I'm still telling the world Amen. that the God that I have turned to satisfied my heart. And yes, I did go work in a machine shop for a few weeks. But you know, it felt good to be human again. I did go into the military and serve two years. But all of that was in preparatory work for what God really wanted me to do, to serve him. And it's been a great journey with the Lord. Out of all the guys that I perform with, there's only one who's alive. And his name, he's changed it. He used to name Bill Fay. He's a songwriter. And by the way, he doesn't live too far from here. I just called him the other day and asked him if he would come to the meetings. And uh, he decided not to come. I think he's a little bit spooked that I'm, I'm going to get a hold of him and you understand? So, um, but he hasn't escaped yet. I know where he lives. So I got to go get him. But anyway, he's the one, by the way, that had a $200 a day drug habit. And the other day when I called him to invite him to the meeting, he said, Lou, he said, uh, you and I are the only ones alive. And I said, Bill, and I thought that you would not be alive with your drugs. He said, it's true, Lou. He said, uh, we did a show, we came to California. And I'd never been to California, and I decided to stay, and the band left. I got a job in the hospital. Then he said, but I was so drugged up, I couldn't be faithful to my, to my job. They finally told me, you either, you either show up on time or no job. And he realized that the drugs were doing the keeping him back. So he said, I decided the job or the drugs and decided I'm going to keep the job. So he got rid of the drugs. Praise God. So when he talked to me, he, he lives by the Rogue River and he said, Lou, he said, I've, got, I've gotten rid of all the drugs, all the alcohol, all the nightlife. He said, that not, not part of me anymore. And he said, uh, I, I love nature now. I love to be out in nature and love the things of nature. So I'm glad that, he's, that I don't have to work with that, that's behind me when I, work, when I deal with him, you understand. But we're the only ones that remain. I'm thankful that God delivered me Amen. from that situation and brought me to the place where I could find him, who in him I am complete. Amen. And perhaps this morning there may be some of you who have tried to find completeness in this and in that. And today, as you're listening to this message, you recognize that the only one that could make you complete really is Jesus Christ. He's the only the, the, the one that could satisfy the longing of the hearts. And young people who are listening to me, don't be deceived. Don't allow yourself to think that if you can just do this or do that, you're gonna be complete. Your only completeness could be found in Jesus. In who? In Jesus. He's the only one that will bring completeness to your heart. He's the only one that could satisfy the longing of the heart. And we need him in our hearts. What do you say? How many of you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Can I see your hands? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. How many of you who have, who have not would like to raise your hand and say, Lord, I hear you speaking to me. And I want to have that experience. I want to find my completeness only in you. Anyone? 
who for the first time would open their hearts to Jesus and say yes to him. If anyone here who has not yet made that commitment, well, it's good to know that all of you have. Thank God for a Lord that loves us and that longs to save us. What do you say? And ye are complete in him. Let's pray. Father, how merciful you've been to me in my life. How merciful you've been to all of us. For if it were not for you, we wouldn't be here sitting today and rejoicing in what you're able to do in the human heart and life. And Lord, we want to rededicate ourselves to you. And we pray that you will continue to help us to grow in love for you, and that you'll also use us to bring the message that can only satisfy the human heart to others. Bless each one of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.